come with us now, if you dare, down a rickety staircase into a dank, dark basement. What awaits the Saturday Night Freak Show? <laughs> hey, thanks for listening to the Saturday Night Freak Show podcast, where a movie review podcast comes your way every Saturday, whether you're ready for it or not. Hey, do us a favor. Wherever you found us, go over and hit the like or subscribe button. Hey, write us a review if you're on Apple, iTunes, or uh, you know wherever you found us. All of that stuff helps us uh, get found by other like-minded folks like you. And, uh, you know, we gotta we gotta play the algorithms. That's the whole whole thing we're we're aiming for here. Uh, these are the internet radio superstars: Michaela, Holly, and I'm Colin. Sean is on assignment. He's always on some assignment, isn't he? <laughs> is it like is it like a like a hero's journey type thing? Oh, maybe, maybe. He, pro- he probably thinks it is. <laughs> <laughs> he's he's in some small town right now, and some little kids ask him to teach him how to do something. He's like, "No, oh, I can't do that." <laughs> <laughs> well, what are you talking about? This is, uh, ironically, this conversation ties into the movie we watched tonight. Holly, what do we? Are, are, uh, yeah, but you chose the movie. What did we watch tonight? Yeah. Tonight we watched a little forgotten gem from uh, 1987 called Steel Dawn. Directed by? Directed by Lance Houle. Oh, Houle. Okay. Houle. Produced by? (laughs) Oh, produced by. I think it's Um, also Lance Houle and his brother. Yeah, I was going to say, I think it's, I think it's, yeah, I think he did, yeah. And starring his nephew, like Chuck Houle as Jux. I don't know if his name is Chuck Houle, but that just sounds (laughs) funny. (laughs) Chuckle. <laughs> um, I don't know the little kid. There's a little blonde kid who looks like Anakin Skywalker. Uh, yeah, Br- yeah, Brett. Brett Hool. Yeah. Brett Hool. Okay. Yeah. yeah, they're staying away from the Chucks in that family. Is there a Charles? Is it Charles Hool? We can call him Chuck. Is that his brother, the <laughs> co-producer? I think so. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Chuck Hool. I'm sure. Why not? You know, what, right. Colin. We can probably make up facts about this movie. Yeah, and no one's gonna fact check us. You know what? That might actually be more fun. Let's just make it up from here on. <laughs> well, this, so this movie uh, comes to us from 1987, and it's uh, a movie that probably no, none of you have seen in the theater. Um, I don't. Not many people saw it in the theater. <laughs> but if you did, please tell us all about that experience. Yeah, because yes. it, it did play in theaters, right? I mean, this is a Vestron yeah. Pictures. Release. It did. It, it it did not do well in the theaters at all. Opening weekend, it made three hundred and eleven thousand. Uh, total gross was five hundred and sixty-two thousand. This was after Swayze. Was it like this? Is right at this is the immediate oh. follow-up to Dirty Dancing, right? No, not exactly. He filmed this after Dirty Dancing, so but it hadn't come out. It was the same year, actually. They both came out in eighty-seven. Okay, so he he filmed this um, before the release of Dirty Dancing, oh. so. Everyone, everyone kind of like was surprised when this came out, but it was like, well, he had already done it. Like he, it was already in the works. You know, he wasn't famous when he took this role. He had already done like some small, some small stuff. He did like the outsiders and yeah. stuff, but, but he wasn't like a household name yet. Yeah. He wasn't the breakout of the outsiders. That movie is a crowded movie with A-listers for sure. Yeah, it is. Although at the time they were all pretty tiny. Right. You know? They, well, none of them were very well known. The movie uh, that I remember him from was uh, Red Dawn, right? He was in '85, yes. right? Red Dawn, yeah. where he was the he was the lead in that. I think because even Charlie Sheen was like second to him in Red Dawn. Yeah, him. yeah, he was the lead. But again, that I don't think that movie was real big when it came out. I think it, yeah, Red Dawn think, was pretty big. I mean, it seemed like it? yeah. I mean, the 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 culture knew about it because it was controversial. The idea that, you know, the Russians were going to invade the U S and I think, uh, was red dawn. I think it was the second movie to be rated PG 13. If I remember correctly, I think a movie with Gene Wilder called the woman in red was the first PG 13 movie when they, they invented the PG 13. And then uh, red dawn was the first PG 13 movie. So, or, you know, second, Mm -hmm. so it goes down in history. But yeah, Dirty Dancing is what made him like a household name, though. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, because he was the leading man in Red Dawn. But again, like it wasn't it was controversial, but it wasn't like the smash hit kind of movie. You know what I mean? Like well known, talked about, but not like everyone saw it. Dirty Dancing was the one that everyone made a fuss about. 
And that so was that's a when movie, it was like Swayze fever. If I remember correctly, that movie didn't even do well in theaters either. It was on video that that movie didn't it set like some record at the time of like it was the first VHS release to make, you know, I don't know, some ungodly obscene amount of money. I think so. Like yeah, it yeah. was a sleeper hit. That's what they call them. The sleeper hit of the summer. Dirty Dancing. So, And I feel like that's a lot of Swayze movies, honestly. Well, it was after Dirty Dancing, I think, that that was when they cast him in Roadhouse, right? Joel Silver, mm-hmm. producer Joel yeah, Silver was, comes around. Yeah, that was 89. Says, Let's get this guy in a movie. And then Point Break, I think, comes like right after that. Ghost is after that. Ghost is yeah. 1990. That's right. Yep. Ghost is before Point Break. Yeah. Uh, so that was mm-hmm. his that was his hot period in uh, mm-hmm. his career. And then yeah, uh, and though, and it was, I mean we, I don't, I don't want to talk about that because we really should talk about Ghost in the future. There's so much to talk about with that movie. Yeah. <laughs> I was I was looking into Swayze a little bit for this. I'm like, fuck, I should have picked Ghost. There is so much <laughs> to talk about with that. <laughs> Well, we, but we can talk about Patrick Swayze all we want in this episode because yeah, sure there's not really a whole lot to talk about the movie itself. We're going to get into it, though, but um, this comes from yeah, a, we, uh, a genre. Yeah, because Lance, Lance Hool, he really, um, he, <laughs> there's not a lot to his repertoire. He um, he directed, first he directed Missing in Action 2 in oh. 85 starring chuck norris but that was the one which, if wait if you go back and listen to our invasion usa episode that was the one that was actually filmed first then they brought in joe zito to do the second one then they flipped the release of them so joe yeah. zito's better movie came out first called missing in action and yeah. lance hools or sorry what's it it's not lance hool is it lance, yeah, lance, hool? lance hool's movie came out second that's missing in action to the beginning yeah, because um, Lance Holt, uh he produced the first Missing in Action, and I think he might have wrote some of it, because um, he was very much involved in the first movie, too, and then the second movie, which, I mean, like we said, was the actually filmed first, um, that's the one that he directed. Um, but yeah, he was very much involved in the first one. Yeah, well, well yeah, because they booted him off his own movie, and he still got to, yeah. you know, the executive producer. Um, yeah, and then it was... Um, he, but then he produced some things, or he also, he directed another movie with Tom Berenger in, ni- in the late 90s. I don't remember what it was called. Um, but not, he, dir- not the he produced the classic movie. Was it? it wasn't The Substitute, was it? No. Um, One Man's Hero with Tom Berenger. Yeah, me either. Yeah. No idea. <laughs> that, was, that was the late 90s. Um, but then, like, he pr- he mainly produced stuff. He produced, like, Man on Fire, which I, I really like that movie with which Denzel Washington. Was- Oh, okay. That's, that's, a great great that. that's a great movie. I love that movie. And he and Colin, he produced Ten to Midnight. Oh, oh did yeah. he? Okay, the Charles Bronson movie. All right, which we did an episode uh, on. Yeah. Um. So, but but other than that, like I was looking through his stuff, and I don't know. Like I said, he produced a few things that I recognized, but I thought um, he produced a lot of stuff. I think that's where he's most famous for. Yeah. He produced like a bunch of. Yeah. Uh, was it? Um, did he produce a bunch of Ridley Scott stuff? Was Man on Fire a Ridley Scott movie? No, it was Tony Scott. Tony Scott. That was Tony Scott, yeah. 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 He no, he produced quite a few movies. That's where his that's where his name is is most uh notable. Um this was written by Doug Leffler, who again, not known for his writing or directing or anything, but he has done a lot of stuff. Uh he's done a lot of art direction and visual effects for some pretty pretty big movies. He worked on The Lost Boys, The Avengers, Spider Man. Uh, some X Men movies and a recent of ours, After Earth. He did uh-huh. some oh, visual God. effects for that. Really? <laughs> so he's a production <laughs> he designer and a video or a visual effects guy who says, "Hey, I can write a movie. Why not?" And we get Steel Dawn, of course. <laughs> I think maybe his talents are you are best put where he's had them recently. Is my opinion yeah. on that? <laughs> Go back to what you're good at, sir. Um, yeah, visually he's he's spectacular. <laughs> well, this movie comes at us from a genre that I believe was established by the original Mad Max movie. This is the post-apocalyptic desert wasteland hero's journey movie. I don't. I'm not even sure that it's a hero's journey, though. To be honest with you, because I don't. We're going to get into obviously trying to decipher this character that Patrick Swayze plays. Patrick Swayze plays a character with no name, of course. Uh, name. He's the Nomad. The Nomad. Is that what he was in the credits? I looked down at that he's, point. He's, yeah, he's just Nomad. 
Okay. I like the Nomad better than just... Me too. That's why I keep saying it. It was just Nomad. I'm like, I like the Nomad. Yeah. I like the... Yeah. Oh, oh, by the way, did we mention, um, with this movie, congratulations, I believe, according to MF Mad, the keeper of the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame, uh, we are inducting uh, Patrick Swayze into the Wall of Fame. about goddamn time. Do you know the three movies that he has uh, appeared in that we've covered that cements his place on the wall? Point Point break. break. Oh, shit. Yes. (laughs) And this? Yes. And, and the other Red classic. Dawn, maybe? No, we did Roadhouse. 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 Oh, <laughs> I was gonna say, I was like, did you do Roadhouse? That was yeah. before my time, but I assumed that was it. Yeah, of course. You have to do Roadhouse. It's a goddamn classic movie. One of the greatest it films is. ever made. But do we do we typically do classic movies, Colin? Uh, these kind, you know. I mean, because we we're on like the level of these are classic movies to our people, right? And we're it's like I feel like Roadhouse is in another level though, like. It's that's everyone's classic, right? It's that. when we were watching this tonight. My husband was like, "I kind of just wish we could watch Roadhouse instead." <laughs> <laughs> I, I was thinking that too. I was like, oh, "I really should. I need to know what's happening in this movie because we're about to talk about it." But I really just want to put in my Blu-ray of Roadhouse. <laughs> well, Mad Max in started these type of movies, which, um, you know, I mean, part of the appeal of them, I think, is that basically you can go out in the desert somewhere and it doesn't require like a whole lot of, um, you know, I mean, what do you have? It, it's desert. You know, I mean, you got some production design, but these guys go and like, you know, cobble stuff together from old leftover. Yeah. I, I think that's I think that's what makes these movies so appealing. You know, like obviously there was a resurgence when we had Mad Max Fury Road. We're like, this is it. This is why. We like these movies because it's fucking badass, right? I think it's because in the desert, you've got this blank canvas and you can just bring it to life and whatever creative vision you have, like you just bring your scraps in and you just get creative. And it's like building a fort when you're a kid, you know, you take scraps and you make a world. And I think that's why it's so appealing to us. Because like, what would we build if the world has collapsed and all we have are scraps and trash? What would we make? You know, I think that's why it's so appealing to people. Okay, so it's just this, like beautiful creation. I want to be well. I mean, beautiful is we're going to put that word in quotes, but um, right? I mean, am I wrong with? <laughs> I don't know. I think, I think, well, beautiful. I think beautiful, like in the sense of like the imagery is just like just. I think creation in itself is beautiful. So, like you know, in this we've got a really grand scaffolding set piece that I looked at. I was like, okay, that's one of the most impressive parts of this movie. Like. There's just this really good, and the little, like, the little, like, cars, the pointy, the pointy cars, I'm just like, I don't know that it's beautiful, but I think it's really cool that someone is, like, envisioning this and bringing it to life, because it's just, it's like building with Legos, I don't know, I think it's cool. Yeah. It's not beautiful in the traditional I mean, it is, because they don't have any money, it's basically. It all so fragile, though. Yeah, because it's like Gaffer's uh, scaffolding or something like that. At one point, there's a searchlight looking around it, you know, and it's like a movie light. You know, it's like when, with the, uh, what do you call those, the barn doors on it and everything. You couldn't get an actual searchlight. You got a movie light. But, but that's know, the it's, thing. It's, like, in, a, in a post-apocalyptic world, you can just do half-ass shit. And you're like, well, it's yeah. apocalypse. You glue it you together. It. Okay, so. There's some obvious duct tape and tinfoil in this movie, though. There are. There are, yeah. Well, you got to have that metallic surface for a movie called steel dawn am i right right but steel I, dawn. you can also make it look more like you know real steel and not why is the guy's name the, not like max not steel or something like that i mean he wasn't anything justin steel he i thought for sure they were going to say his sword was named steel dawn anything I know. but it's just a the, title uh, steel dawn i have no idea what it means i mean i guess there is a lot of metal in the movie and the dawn does happen for this mo- the working title for this movie makes more sense it was Desert Warrior. That's like the great value title. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but it makes more sense to me. It's like, okay, I know where that's coming from. I don't know what the Steel Dawn is. Hmm. I guess it's I guess it's like the dawn of time and this is the t- this is the steel time, I guess. I don't know. Well, we are saying like, that yeah, it is post apocalyptic. Yeah. It's, it's post apocalyptic cuz uh, uh, I think we see at some point a uh, there's like a pretty actually good shot toward the beginning of this movie where he's stalking through the desert and passes by this big um I don't know if it's a tanker or there's a ship basically beached in the middle of the desert. That is um 
That is the wreck of the Edward Bolin, which is a cargo ship that wrecked in 1909, because this was filmed in the Namibian Desert. So it's an actual shipwreck from 1909. Wow, so that's uh, using the production design where you find it, or production value. Going right. Out there. Location. <laughs> yeah. Um, the, uh, the, the movie actually did start off in a way that was very encouraging uh, to me yes. anyway. The first, like, five minutes of it, um, where we meet the nomad standing on his head, meditating out in the middle. I don't know if stand, uh, your hero standing on his head is like the best way to uh, establish his badassery, but uh, he is then attacked by these like walrus people who tunnel up out of the sand. Uh, right? right? I mean, say they're walrus people, but they're, they're people covered. They're like the sand people from Star Wars, right? I was going to say, they're like yeah. the sand basically but, yeah this movie kind of proves like time is a flat circle because it steals from star wars and mad max but then like i'm pretty convinced that the prequel movies steal from this movie it's just a very cyclical thing happening there's so many things in this movie that you're like yep seen it before yep seen it before yep that's from that movie and you're yeah. assuming that anyone on the lucasfilm team actually saw this <laughs> if like I'm th- I'm convinced like nobody saw it. Well, we we did get some mail on it, so somebody saw yeah, it back know. in There's, the day. There is actually a cult following for get this movie. The fuck there, out of there. I mean, I I think the, I think the cult following might be limited to that that sect of people that just really likes post apocalyptic Mad Max ripoffs. But there is a cult following. Yeah. I could see George Lucas being one of those weird people. I can too. I can too. When you were saying George Lucas, I was like, yeah, no, there's some definite like parallels to the prequels in this for sure. He's he, I wouldn't be so if you told me he owned like a 35 millimeter print of this movie, I'd be like, yeah, that tracks. Like he probably collects all kinds of weird stuff like that. Uh, like they're like in his den, he's got a signed poster of this movie that he had Patrick Swayze sign at one point. Right. Yeah. And Swayze's like, not, not, not ghosts, not dirty dancing, not yeah. even the outsiders. Yeah. He's like, he's like, really? And they're like, it's for George Lucas. He's like, okay, I'll do okay, it. Right. It has one of the most <laughs> boring posters I've ever seen, which I think is just like a black and white photo of uh, Patrick Swayze's face. Oh, you know what? He looks like, um, it was, that was actually the thing that struck me watching this movie with his hair. He's got like this long hair and his hair is very dark because he hasn't got that L.A. tan or whatever yet. He's from Texas or something, right, Swayze? Yeah. He's originally- yeah, he's from Texas. But it uh, he looks like his brother Don Swayze. Like he does, so yeah. much in this. I was like, holy shit, is it Don? Like Don really does look like him. He really does. Yeah. There's, there's another, like if you go on IMDb, like the main picture that they have for this movie um, I don't know if that was the if that was the like theater poster that they had or anything, but that's a, that's pretty decent artwork. That's pretty cool. It's just it's got, his face, right? His head. No, no, no. This is a different one. Oh, okay. This one is this one's way cooler. Um, we need to uh, yeah. we need to put it up at some point on our social okay, media because it's pretty only badass. Seen the, like uh, VHS it, cover. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it's the VHS cover. It's pretty awesome. We need to put that up at some point. It's like him with the sword, and then like him fighting, and it, it's pretty it's pretty dope. Yeah, that opening scene where you know these guys come out of the ground and attack him, and he fends them off with a sword. It's like okay, we're going with some chem- kind of samurai influence here or something. But it's yeah, actually like a sure. pretty good scene, and it's like wow, this movie's setting itself up to be like the coolest thing ever. You get this badass <laughs> hero. Out in the middle of the post-apocalyptic desert, fighting off, you know, mole men or whatever that come up and attack you. And you're like, okay, this is going to be cool. We're going to have creatures and we're going to have action and all this stuff. And the promise yeah. of this movie that is soon to unspool before us. <laughs> um, yeah, you should really just turn the movie off after that scene's over, honestly. <laughs> I know. I was telling you, I was worried that, well, like, as soon as this scene's over and as soon as somebody starts to talk, it's all going to go downhill. Um he uh so the wandering nomad goes to a small town and mm-hmm. there he meets um his uh, former mentor i believe because what we're supposed to get out of this you know you got to correct me if i'm wrong here so the nomad was used to be a part of some kind of um military force or something the guard is that all they're called yeah. the guard i think so i'm not entirely sure what the guard did no, but they keep talking about the war. So clearly there was like a World War Three, where after that the world kind of like 
disintegrated and this is the result of that war and he was some sort of like special forces soldier in that war is what we're getting from this okay because at some point somebody later says like what was the world like before the sandstorms came and i'm like okay was it a nuclear apocalypse was it like you know a natural thing or like what happened here but there was a war that they talk about right that he was a part of Mm -hmm. and uh anyway the um we're actually inducting somebody else on the wall of fame here and that's uh, John Fujioka, who played uh, the uh, chord his, that is his mentor. Sensei? Yes, yeah. because you will recognize that guy from our episode on American Ninja. Well, he was the mentor there also. And also. I was just thinking about Michael Dudikoff this week. <laughs> yeah? I was like, what's he up to? Nothing. That's, That's an interesting answer. out of left field. Well, like, what inspired you to think about <laughs> Michael Dudikoff this week? Uh, because I was thinking you don't about randomly the think about him in your spare time. <laughs> I can't. I was say. thinking about the movie The Expendables and thinking about how he never. How did he never make it into one of those movies? I, I'm just imagining Michaela <laughs> just saying like, I wonder what he's doing right now. <laughs> yeah. Let's look up Michael Dudikoff and see what he's. And then I looked up his IMDb and I had a like a weird moment all over again because i didn't i forgot that there was four american ninja movies oh yeah and then did you, and then did you message him on on instagram and you're like what you thinking about <laughs> <laughs> like, which uh which color ninja suit was your favorite because you remember that movie had like 20 different colors yeah. of ninja suits yeah dude I, I bet he's the kind of guy that would message back i bet you <laughs> uh, we could do a michael dudikoff uh dm section of the mailbag every week do it do it. DMing Dudikoff. I love it. <laughs> well, we also got, uh, just to finish that off, Fujioka was also in uh, Mortal Kombat. He was right. the chief priest. So that puts him in three movies. So he gets his photo on the Saturday Night Freak Show Wall of Fame. Welcome. I'm excited. Congratulations, sir. So this gives us a little bit of backstory of what's going on. He explains, you know, basically he was in the war and uh, there's this, some town or an organization called Meridian. I think it's a town. What the hell are we talking about? Meridian? I think it's, I think it's like a province. I, I wasn't clear. Okay. And soon after, uh, Swayze goes into the bar and they're sitting in, I think uh, his mentor here, Cord, is trying to recruit him. Like, you need to come back to the surface or something like that. Uh Swayze is poisoned, right? He drinks because the bartender serves him drinks and Swayze drinks it and like, oh my God, he knocks the glass out of uh, Cord's hand. You know, he's like, oh my God, you've been poisoned. Swayze falls to the ground, but it's not, it's like a sleeping poison. He doesn't puke or anything. He's not dead. It's just, he falls down is incapable of doing anything as this evil bad guy comes in and kills his mentor. So he like paralyzes him. Yeah. So it's paralyzing Phil, uh, formula so you can come in the bad guy in this movie uh which well, one okay so this is the this is the enforcer the, bad or the henchman the henchman yeah the in- okay. the henchman the enforcer henchman hair. yeah what's going on what animal did they have to kill to make this guy's wig i love this wig can we just talk about it for a second have you guys have you guys ever seen the movie one crazy summer have you seen this movie? I don't think so. Uh, a it's a Savage ago. Steve Holland movie with John yeah. Cusack and yeah, one of the Murray then. brothers and Demi Moore. It, it's one of my all-time favorite movies. I've watched, I've watched it like a million times. It's a great summer movie. Um, but in the beginning of that movie, there is this like crazy rock star with like spiky hair. And that's exactly what I thought of when I saw this wig. I was like, this is pure 80s magic in this wig right now. It's yeah. fantastic. That's what I it's was like wondering. a spiky mullet. But it's huge. It's huge. It's, I mean, the size it's of the thing, it's like, a, an, it's like a spiky afro on this guy's head. Um, it's like, I almost feel like he can't see when he's wearing it. Yeah. And it's got a long ponytail down the back. And it, I mean, obviously, it must be you know inspired by it's, 80s metal bands of the time or whatever. It's, it's, it's got everything that you want in bad hair. It's got the big spiky fro for no reason that's teased up with hairspray. It's got the mullet. And it's got a rat tail. How do you have all three things? Like it's a marvel. So you're gonna put and this down. And it actually doesn't move. As like well. I thought for yeah. sure that thing was gonna come off. That's what that I was thing expecting is too. Sprayed to hell with Aquanet. It's amazing. We gotta find out if that was actually Christopher Neem's real hair. Christopher Neem is the uh, actor who plays. And guess what? 
Christopher Neem is now on the Saturday Night Freak Show oh, Wall of Fame shit. because he this was... This movie is bringing everyone to the wall. This is crazy. Well, I mean, our devoted listeners will remember Christopher Neem as the henchman bad guy Johnny Alucard in the movie Dracula AD 1972. 1972. But yeah. uh, you probably don't remember that he was the maitre d' in Ghostbusters 2, which we also did on this show. So there you go. Yeah, Christopher wow. Neem. Congratulations, sir. Yeah. Fantastic. I love it. So he is basically playing, okay, go with me on this. He is playing the part that Jack Palance played in the 1963 movie Shane, okay? And this okay, becomes. I was going to say, at some point, we got to bring up Shane because it's, <laughs> this is the same movie. <laughs> yep. Okay, so this, this is what I like. Who wrote it? When did it come out? Is that the first one of these stories that has influenced every goddamn, you know, movie and story ever since. I mean, I have to imagine that pre Shane, there was the story of the warrior, right? Who's tired of killing who, uh, that's all he's really good at. And he's basically antisocial and suited only for a life of killing and all that stuff that it, Shane, sure. it's, it's, it's like Shane is the first I don't do that anymore movie. <laughs> is it? I'm sure there's a, a samurai movie that started that and Shane copied it. I guarantee it. Would, it. So, well, I it would seems think like, so. Yeah, but the samurai movies, it almost was like they, they borrowed stuff from the American Westerns and then vice, then it ended up influencing like the, the Italian Westerns and then they became, it's, you know. It's right? like a big ancestral thing. It's like, when did it start? I don't know. Yeah. Time is a fly circle. But I mean, this yes. is one of yeah. the classic stories, I guess, you know, just in storytelling that's ever been told is the, the you know, the retired gunfighter who wants to give up the life, who, uh, you know, befriends and becomes the protector of a frontier woman. And then greedy land barons move in. They push him too far because he's like, no, I just want to give up all the killing. But it turns out when pushed too far and all the stakes are down, he's the only guy who can actually, you know, go out there because that's what he's good at. And he goes out and kills them all. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Yeah. That's the entire story right there in a nutshell. How does uh, in the, you see all these, you know, movie variants of that story, including, you know, we were talking during the movie. Pale Rider with uh, Clint Eastwood and famously Malone with Burt Reynolds, which we watched on this show. They try to flesh this out in some way, right? They try to give more stuff to the character and the world and the surroundings and give motivations and all that. But this movie um, pretty much just rides on that synopsis. Do you think? I mean, is it really oh, like... Oh, yeah. <laughs> is it yeah. building these people out? Fleshing them out. Carefully. No, <laughs> no, I know they they rely on that pretty heavily. Well, <laughs> I always... There are long stretches of this movie with no dialogue, and like in a well written movie that can work, but in this movie, it like I don't, it just doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Well, I wonder if the casting. I mean, it's because this is part of the whole. So the whole thing is, you know. And I'm going to jump around here, and I might spoil the ending, and then we'll have to come back and cover the little bits and pieces of the the plot. I, but. I don't. I'll, I'll tell. I'll tell you right now, listeners. Um, we're not going to spoil the ending because you know the ending. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's right. You've, You've seen, seen it. any movie in the past fifty no, years. You know the ending. <laughs> you know the ending. <laughs> but the idea, it's like you got this character, right? Who, um, the way they're writing it, it's like, okay, he does not belong here, right? This is some kind of, you know, he's trying to give up this life, but that's the, that life is where he belongs, in violence, right? And he's trying to adopt a nonviolent existence and trying to, like, make himself better and appeal to the better angels of his being. And it turns out that, like, it's a curse, right? Because the thing that he's good at, that he wants to get away from, that he's morally has an objection to, to that part of himself ends up the thing that he has to do in order to save and protect the people, you know, in his charge. Um, mm -hmm. But even right there, even saying that I, it feels like I just gave a lot more credence to the, that character than is given in this movie at the end of the movie, right before we get the Shane, come back Shane scene, which actually does happen in this um, with little kids running out, you know, trying to call yeah. him back. Uh, he packs up all, yeah, after he's, 
you know, killed all the bad guys and all he's taking care of everything. He comes back to the the lady and he's like, I got to go because I don't belong here. And I'm sitting there going like, what the fuck are you talking about? You just got rid of all the bad guys and now you can live in peace with this woman that you love. I don't I did not understand. It was like, what they do not. They do not clearly state his motives at all. They don't they don't show like the emotional conflict he's going through. They really don't express it at all. I feel like I don't know anything about him. No, we don't. We don't know anything about him. Well, we don't know anything about anyone, really. We don't get, like, they might try to hint at a backstory here and there, but it doesn't work. We don't get a sense of anyone in this. Would it have been better if they didn't cast, like, a Hollywood hunk in the lead? And I'm trying to think, like, who you would cast, but, like, for some reason in my mind, I'm thinking of, like... No, because then we have Circle of Iron. (laughs) That's true. Well, okay, but you... (laughs) But okay, but if you if you cast a different person, it's still the same writing. It's not going to make any difference. I, but see, and yeah. like, I, almost, I almost wonder like if it we, would. Like if, you mentioned, he wasn't he wasn't like a full on Hollywood hunk yet. He wasn't a household name yet. I mean, yeah, he was getting there, but he wasn't there yet. Well, maybe I'm so not, I don't I'm not really making this point sense. right. But I, what I'm saying is, I guess that you know, it's like Patrick Swayze comes off like normal dude, right? It's like he's yeah. normal dude. He's just like uh, aloof for no reason. It's like, okay, maybe he has some kind of PTSD or trauma. This, uh, again, I'm giving you more than there is in the movie. <laughs> um, <laughs> but like, I keep thinking of the character of Marv, the, the one that Mickey uh, Rourke played in uh, Sin City. Like, imagine if he looked like that, right? You know, if he was yeah. this big bruiser dude who was like, you know, kind of like, this is all that I'm good at is, you know, using my seen fists. Some, he's seen some <laughs> shit. Yeah. Yeah. Like that would totally change the context of the movie, but you could still play it with the exact same dialogue. You know what I mean? Yeah. So casting in that way would change that dynamic <laughs> and be like, oh, yeah. okay, I get it. This guy clearly doesn't belong here. <laughs> but Patrick yeah. Swayze is like, you know, he's just some like- dude. Yeah, pretty dude. You met a pretty girl. Like, makes sense to me. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um. Well, so he does. Uh, he does. Uh, you know, after after, and I guess he has. You know, we set up in that scene where his mentor is killed. We set up a revenge um, motivation, right? Yeah. Which yeah. doesn't really. It's almost by happenstance, I guess. I mean, I suppose that's the way you set up the, these narratives. It's like, well, okay. In addition to just kind of uh, uh, doing something selfless and protecting, you know, these frontiers people who are trying to make a, you know, build a new life out here. Um, mm-hmm. He's also got he's got a personal beef with the the second in command henchman. Which but I it, yeah, but I, it, like too, you know, everything we've we've this. seen this we've seen this done so much better. The first thing that comes to my mind is a recent watch for me, The Mandalorian, <laughs> when <laughs> he takes Baby Yoda to the planet to hide him, but he ends up protecting this village. Yeah, you know, this is a we've seen this done it, way yeah. better, and we've seen it done, <laughs> done with motivation that we understand. Mm-hmm. Um, well, okay, so he he moves on. He 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 comes to this uh, farm. Uh, what do they farm? Uh, They're a purification farm, <laughs> not unlike a moisture farm. Yeah, there you go. Uh, not borrowing from Star Wars at all. Um, yeah. and <laughs> definitely doesn't look like Tatooine at all. No, it doesn't. Not and even a little bit. Everybody's in tunics, <laughs> but there's a bunch of farm hands working here. So I mean, this is where I'm like, okay, this is a western, right? It's like there's the yeah. lady of the who owns the place because uh, her husband was also a soldier. He died in the war, which of course this is how you set these things up, right? Because now you're missing sure. a father figure for the kid and a lover for her. <clears throat> Sorry, I ran out of breath. And. uh She's got a bunch of guys working there. The most famous face you'll recognize is Brian James. Um, he was in Blade Runner, right? He's in all the 48 Fifth Hours Element. movies. And, yeah, Fifth Element, right? Yeah. Um, very intense guy. Unfortunately, he died of a heart attack. Uh, I think he was in mm, his 50s. He, did. he died. Um, and uh, the, the woman of the house, I'm sorry, her name is Kasha? Kasha, yeah. Kasha, that's right, because it's the future. We get names like Kasha and Judd and Trank. Trank? Tark. Like Tark. Sorry, even Tark. better. <laughs> Tark. <laughs> Tark's the henchman. Judd's the jub. Real close Jux. to Tarkin, isn't it? Jux. Oh, that's true. Jux. Yeah, Jux is the kid, and Kasha is the woman. The woman is played by Lisa Nemi, right? Yes. Is that how I pronounce her name? I think so. It's Nemi or Niemi, or I think it's 
Something like that. Okay, but this is significant, right? Because who is she? She is significant. She is the lifetime, basically, wife of our star, Patrick Swayze. They were together for 34 years. They got married in 75, and they were together until the day he died in 2009. And they met when they were teenagers. Like, they have the best love story. She was 14. He was 19, but not in a creepy way. Like, he... They met because um, his mom was a dance teacher and she was one of her students. And then when she like, became of age, they ended up dating and fell in love like instantly and got married in 75. And yeah, like never looked back. They had a great marriage, a great love life. Um, they didn't have any kids, which kind of surprised me. No kids. Oh, really? Yeah, she did have a miscarriage at one point, but yeah, they didn't have any children. Yeah. She wrote a book like maybe a year or two after he died about their like love story together. And I've heard from like, I haven't read it, but I've heard from multiple people. Like the audio book is like incredible to listen to. She reads uh, yeah, it, I, haven't, I haven't read it, but I hear that too. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, um, it's, it's amazing that, you know, especially if you, if you, if you marry that young, that you can survive the kind of the faint, you know, that, yeah. that part of his career to, when he blew up. Very, yeah, to marry that young is already like dangerous, and then to be a Hollywood couple, dangerous. Like, there's so many obstacles that could have come between them, and and he dealt with alcoholism for a long time. He, um, you know, he took a break from acting in the '90s and ended up um, raising horses. He was a horse breeder um, mm-hmm. just to get away from Hollywood for a while and and get cleaned up and everything. Um, and I I think that kind of re-strengthened their their marriage. But yeah, she, they were completely in love with each other. He, the song, um, she's like the wind that he wrote for dirty dancing. He wrote that about her. She's in dirty dancing too, right? I think she's, isn't she like one of the other dancers? I think she's like a a, a background. She's not like a main character. I think she's like a background. Yeah. I thought she she was was with him for more than half of her life. Yeah. Yeah. That's crazy. Yeah. Yeah. And like, yeah, she talks about like the day he died, like she could, they were just like cuddling together and she could tell by his breathing that it was about time. And she told him that she loved him and his last words were that he loved her too. And it's yeah. just like the most heartbreaking <laughs> fucking thing. So like I started, hand. I started tearing up. I was like, Jesus Christ. This, why? <laughs> he was so young. <laughs> How old was he when he died? He, he was in his fifties, right? 57? 57, I think. Okay. I think so. Something like that. Yeah, I Sometimes I forget he died, you know, like it, oh. Oh. Sometimes I forget that because it's been a while and it was so tragic and just like, but it was kind of prolonged because you're like, you had heard for a while that he had cancer, but like nobody comes back from pancreatic cancer. So he was already in like stage three, I think when he found out and it Mm -hmm. was just like, he he battled it for a while, but. Oh, well, well, he left us some good movies, a lot of which I haven't seen. I don't think I've seen next of kin yet or uh, black dog, which we, you know, fatherhood. Mm -hmm. Or uh, I think there's another action movie that he did in there. I, would, I don't think people give him enough credit for his role in Donnie Darko. Yeah, he's great in that. I love that's, him in that. I think that's the last thing, last last time I remember seeing him and that he made an impression, you know, because it was like he's not doing a physical role at that point. It was like, okay, this is Patrick Swayze doing like a character bit, you know, which I like. Right. Yeah. And, and an emotional, like, a, a very, um, like intense character, you yeah. know, heavy, With a, yeah. yeah, a heavy care. That's a great word for it. He's a, it's a heavy character. It's yeah. I need to watch that movie again. I haven't watched that in a long time. Yeah. Well, in the movie, uh, the, of course, um, what goes on at this little, uh, encampment, the ranch that she's got, um, they have, um, it's valuable land, of course, is what, you know, it's always come down to. Instead of having, like, a silver mine or gold on the land, they've got... What was it in Malone that they were sitting on that they wanted him to get off the... I can't remember. Uh, I feel oil. Or the, yeah, Probably. was it? I, think I feel it was like oil. I blocked that movie. <laughs> um, Everything except the bad hair piece. Yeah. <laughs> the helmet hair of Burt Reynolds. Um... But she's got an underground spring or something. Uh, so because it's a post post apocalyptic, of course she's got water. So like Claudia Cardinal in uh, Once Upon a Time in the West, she's gonna you know build this town uh, around the plot of land. She's gonna irrigate. That 
everything. That's exactly what I was thinking during this too, was Once Upon a Time in the West. Yeah, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> it's just borrowing from all these, uh, I mean, because this is the thing, they are thinking that the story itself is uh, your myth building, right? And so you've got mythic characters, but the thing that makes characters mythic seems to be like the, you know, the way they have to do these heroic deeds that people talk about, you know? And like, oh my God, or you have to build up like, oh, he really was something before and kind of see it. I even thought they bungled that with uh, the Christopher Neem bad guy, um, you know, at the end of the movie when they finally have their showdown in the street, which is shot like a Western, even though they have uh, swords, you know, and they're standing off yeah. at the ends of no, the... This, this- this movie has such a split personality because I feel like there's so much that like they wanted it to be like a um, like a Shogun kind of a movie. And then they wanted it to be a Mad Max movie. They wanted it to be a Western. I was like, they don't I feel like they didn't really understand what movie they were making. Well, I think all those post-apocalyptic things basically like it became uncool kind of in Hollywood to do Westerns for a while. Uh, sure. you know, Westerns were old and passe and then the Italians reinvented them and nobody had really done anything except Clint Eastwood was still making them. So the post-apocalyptic science fiction movie became like their the way Western. Of redoing. Yeah. yeah. It was Western stories, but now in futuristic dress, you know what I mean? Sure. Um, but like, I wonder, I wonder if, um, I wonder if it was written with like those, with like those um, mar- like martial arts undertones, if, like the Shogun undertones, or if they use Patrick Swayze's background with martial arts to influence that. I, I wonder which came first. Yeah, they're just like, there's going to be some cool fight scenes here. And then he's athletic. Yeah. I mean, he's athletic when he's doing, you know, his jumps and twirls over things. And, you yeah. know, it's like, okay, this guy he, looks like yeah, he could be he was a fighter. Tra- he was trained in, like, three different kinds of martial arts. So, like, they yeah. knew that he would be able to bring a lot to that role, which I actually really enjoyed the fight choreography. As little as there was, I thought it was pretty solid for a movie this low budget. That's the problem, though. It's like you expect that there's going to be a lot of action in this movie or something, especially based on a movie that starts off with that five minute scene at the beginning. You're like, okay, we're in capable hands here. These are people who know what the hell they're doing. And then as the movie goes on, it's like, well, it's not really about that at all. Yeah. Eventually, there will be some kind of fights or skirmishes, but nothing really. uh, This is a movie without explosions or or bloodletting or gore or anything like that. It's just kind of. You know, like I, I can see fight with swords. Yeah, like, I like. I wonder if they started making this movie and they. I like. I wonder if Patrick Swayze was having like his own private meditation ses- like session where he was like on standing on his head and they were like, "Oh, we should do that in the movie." Or if that was scripted, <laughs> you know what I mean? Oh, yeah, I see what you're saying, yeah. he was really into that kind of thing. Like he studied Buddhism and transcendentalism, and he actually studied Scientology for a while and realized like, "Oh, that's not for me." Um, but, but I, like, he was really into that kind of thing. So I really do wonder if he was just like doing one of his own, like headstand meditation things. And they're like, Ooh, I like that. Let's use it. Yeah. Cause what do you do? You write it for that character. You're going to have to learn to stand on your head or you get okay, a guy who's a like, weird thing to write in. Yeah. This is just something that he does. Well, he befriends the, uh, the son, you know, the little kid who looks, I mean, spitting image. Oh, of, Anakin Skywalker, uh, Anakin you mean? Skywalker. Yeah. That's yeah. the one. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, fixing a pod. Oh, I'm sorry. It's a wind racer. He's fixing speed right. racer. Whatever. It's same thing. <laughs> That's Chekhov's wind racer. Because if you're fixing one in the first act, you know, there's going to be a intense, uh, high Slow speed doused. chase. <laughs> yeah, well, the tra- if you guys okay yeah listeners like we might tell you not to watch this movie but you should at least watch the trailer so you understand what we're talking about with this movie and the trailer is very misleading because you think there's going to be like a post-apocalyptic jousting session with wind racers and it just doesn't happen I wow was- that sounds like what happened when you watched the trailer from alone too <laughs> oh i know i have a record you guys i'm not i'm not I'm not in denial of that. I understand what I'm doing. Which I, I'm not saying it's your fault. I'm just time is a flat circle because we're basically like doing a a reboot version of the Malone episode episode right now. I blame Colin because he tells me about these movies and I look at the trailer <laughs> and I'm like, I'm bringing it. Yeah. I blame Sean because Sean wasn't here for Malone and now he's not here again. <laughs> well, the I marketing, think if Sean would have been here, this would have been a better movie. The marketing department on these things definitely does promise you something. I mean, like those guys are gifted. You know, I mean, it's like yeah. seeing what they had to work with and the trailer that they gave. It's like, Seriously. Okay, well, you got me interested. 
And having watched that movie, I don't know how I would have sold it to people, but is there, yeah, is, I just paid to rent it. Yeah. Is there a prestigious, uh, I can refund your money. There's, <laughs> is there a prestigious award for trailer cutting? Because I there needs so. to be. Yeah. I think we got to look there that up. It's a, yeah. Some of these people I'm like, bravo, sir or madam, <laughs> whoever cut this trailer. Cause you did good, man. And they're like nameless. There be they don't an get Oscar credits. For trailers and for title sequences. Yeah, you, I think so too. Well, title sequences, at least you get credit. Trailer trailer editors are like faceless. You have no idea who, who they are anymore. They probably get paid nothing too. Yeah. Um, so, I mean, the dynamic basically comes in when uh, Anthony Zerb or Anthony Zerby, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name. I'm going to go with Zerb, but I mean, obviously, he's been around for years. You've seen his face. He was in. Uh, the Omega Man, he was the lead vampire dude in the Charlton Heston Omega Man. He was in Kiss Meets the Phantom of the Park. Uh, oh, so was Christopher, or Christopher Dean was in that, too. Uh, he was in the James Bond movie License to uh, Kill. I mean, he's been around forever. He's the slimy bad guy here. He's basically, he's the land baron, right? He's the guy who wants to, he wants the land because it's got, the, you know, the valuable thing on it. And he wants to chase all these pig herders out so he can control the, the resource. Um, yeah, I know. You've heard this story before. Um, I, I got a question for you, actually. Like, maybe you can refresh my memory. Uh, at the beginning, uh-huh. they were talking about, like, you know, there, there's a peacemaker or peacekeeper, something like that, coming to this settlement. They've just got word uh, from the higher-ups at Meridian that they're sending over, I assume this is the version of the Marshall right, is going to come and bring law right. to this land. Uh, a Bedouin guy shows up. I'm like, was he supposed to be an emissary of this? He never shows up in the movie again, I don't think. Uh, the peacekeeper never shows up in the movie. That's promised, no. right? Okay, I'm just making sure right. I didn't miss anything. This is laid out in the plot and then just kind of abandoned. Um, yeah, which seems to happen in this movie. Like, we get sand people and then they go away and we get a brief introduction and then death of the samurai master and then we get talk of the peacekeeper like there's a lot of things introduced and then they just aren't again i get all yeah i was telling you about there's gonna be we we thought there were gonna be creatures in this movie we were wrong no more sand people no more nothing that was as far sci-fi as you're gonna get uh it literally is a uh i don't know if it's a drama it's not a thriller i suppose it's it's a domestic drama I mean, the the idea is, you know, there's going to be some sexual tension there, you know, uh, especially you've got like Patrick Swayze and his wife. So the idea is, you know, she longs for uh, companionship and somebody, you know, to help her with her kid. And, you know, and he's this, you know, guy who's been alone for so long that, you know, and then they're both together and like, when are they going to? And even though I think the movie thinks that that's there, did that come across to you? (laughs) No. So when no. they when she was like, oh, turn over, let me look at your back, because he said he had like irritated an old injury, and then he started asking about like her husband. I was like, I swear to God, if she says like, oh, there was no husband, I just like magically got pregnant with this kid. I was gonna be like, George Lucas, you bastard. <laughs> I was waiting for her to be like, there was no father, like there was no husband. Yeah. But he, there was. He just died. Yeah, but that's the thing. It's like you know he. He does then, supposedly, I mean, it seems like he cares for her. She cares for him, which it makes the end of the movie, like, inscrutable to me. You know? It's it just makes like, no sense. <laughs> you know? Because it's like, well, yeah. I love you. But at some point, he does have the cliched thing where he's like, you know, because uh, he gets his ass handed to him in combat at some point where the guys don't kill him again when they should, right? I mean, uh, I think he goes to town. Brian James gets killed because he's drunk and Brian James thinks that he's a top dog ranch hand, but after they pull off this uh, nighttime raid on the bad guy's camp where they have to steal a water pump, because the bad guys have destroyed theirs, of course, you got to go get it, uh, all the attention of all the other ranch hands and uh, Kasha is on the Nomad, and so this is a little subplot where Brian James feels like he's dejected. He runs off, goes to town, gets drunk, and of course the bad guys attack, and so Brian James gets killed and uh, the kid gets abducted and uh, Swayze gets his ass handed and he gets beat by the bad Mm -hmm. guys. One of whom I think is Arnold Vosloo, uh, the mummy. Yes, it is. It is. Right. I recognize his face in the crowd. The one that they really never cut to Uh, this chase. He hasn't really really aged. I know he looks exactly the same. 
He looks exactly the same. He yeah. may or may not have had hair. I don't know. He had a, he had a, a rag in his head. So yeah, He looked exactly the same <laughs> as the mummy. <laughs> Literally. Um, well, they abduct the kid, and so um, uh, Swayze, of course, and they, at some point they lock Swayze, or she locks, so she, yeah, because she's like, uh, you know, I got to go get my son, and he's like, um, what was his cliched thing? It was like, you know, I can't be with anybody because this war keeps on finding me or whatever, you know, the people around me die. This has happened before, the exact same thing. It's not going to happen again. Right. Yeah. Uh, so she locks him in the fridge. And padlocks it. It's not the fridge. It's what the armory. Oh, it's a it's, room, was, a closet. Yeah. <laughs> it's a storage. It's storage of some sort. I don't know. How did he get out of there? Uh, the the dog let him out. Is that true, Michaela? Did that actually happen? <laughs> That's what it seemed like. I mean, I don't know. Honestly, like I wasn't paying that close attention at that point in the movie because I was like, <laughs> I know where this is going. But yeah. the do- why is the dog in this movie? I don't know. Because the dog has no personality, doesn't really do anything. He befriends this dog. I think that I think they're thinking there's more to it just by showing it, you know. But you know, like the audience doesn't get the emotion of this, or doesn't get these grand connections. Uh, but yeah. yeah, he adopts a dog that you know, or the dog just and then he disappears from the movie for thirty minutes. Yeah, and then you forget that he has a dog until it comes huh. back and magically rescues him from a locked refrigerator or whatever. Which is like a scene from The Shining or something. Like, how did Jack get out yeah. of the, you know? Because you know what? It, she padlocked not, I mean, him in there, and then the dog comes in and starts, like, scratching at the door. We cut away to see what the bad guys are doing. And when we come back, Swayze's suiting up, because you got to have that scene where he's putting on the gloves and putting on his sword upside down and holster. You know what? Now that we're talking about all this, it's it's starting to click. The guy who wrote this movie is relying heavily on visuals, the guy who wrote this movie is an art director. Like, yeah. it makes sense to me now. He's not a fucking writer. He's right. expecting yeah. that the he audience is it. going to pull a lot yeah. from the visuals of this movie. I think that's the thing. Like, you know, we've, I don't know, you know, we've talked about this kind of stuff before, but like, there is, you know, I mean, I think this is me. Whenever I've tried to write stuff before, I have a visual, you know, like, I see the movie in my head and just kind of transcribe it. A real mm-hmm. writer writes like a book about each character before they even start with the plot. They know this right. person from the day they were born until, and so when you put two characters in a room that you know all this backstory about them and you know their psychology, the stuff that they say, you almost really don't even have to think that hard because you know what this person's position is on all of these issues. You know what this other person is, and you know, you know, and it just kind of flows out, you know, of the mm-hmm. characters. This is not that movie. No. <laughs> this is the this, visual. This is, this is a movie written by an art director. <laughs> Yeah, the kid <laughs> escapes at some point. And he's taken captive by Anthony Zerbe and uh, Anthony Zerb and Christopher Neem, and uh, Lisa Neemy goes out there. She's then taken hostage, uh, but the kid gets away, and this leads to the big centerpiece chase scene of the movie and the wind wind racers. That sounds more exciting than it is, folks. <laughs> I was trying to They're build it up slow. so you can you can yeah. I was sitting there going like this kid hops in this thing, which is an impractical vehicle. If I've ever seen one, I'm like, there's no engine in this. It doesn't even look like they could fit a go-kart engine into it. It's basically, I don't know. It's a pyramid that you sit no, in. It looks, and it, has it, looks like a, it looks like a, it looks like those, it. um, it looks like those derby cars, except it's pointed. Yeah. Yeah. And they mm-hmm. embark on a chase where I sat there going like, I think a person at a, at a, you know, casual jog, could probably catch up with these vehicles. <laughs> yeah, I, I feel pretty confident I could catch up with them. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so not that exciting. Uh, but Patrick no. Swayze, of course, comes in to save the day. Saves the day. Uh, has the big standoff with uh, his arch nemesis, the guy who killed his mentor, uh, in the middle of the street. This scene he also. Yeah. Uh, he eventually does, you know, because the guy's like, "You're the you're the uh, the most competition that I've ever had." Because this is where I'm saying they biffed his introduction. Like we had to see something at, toward the beginning where this guy is a skilled killer, the bad guy. Right. But mm-hmm. all we see when he kills people, it's always kind of like a shystery move. You know, he sneaks up and he's got a knife in his knee that he stabs you with. He doesn't even kill you with this, you know, in a fair combat. So we never really mm-hmm. get to see him demonstrate this skill that is supposed to pay off in this scene where you have these two skilled warriors. And it turns out, that Patrick Swayze is the more skilled of them. 
He ends up sticking right. yeah. Christopher Neem through the, the gut with a sword. Yeah, we don't we don't have the mountain versus the hound. We yeah. it's the hero versus a shysty motherfucker that just stabs you in the back. Like yeah. it's it's not right. we don't it's not ex- as exciting, you know. And but this this after he gets stabbed in the gut, the guy continues to live for like a half hour, talking right. about like uh uh you know why you you know you I don't know give me my knives back so I can have an this honorable. Is powers death. in his hair, Colin. I guess so. <laughs> So you should have cut his head off or scalped him or something yes. like that? Yeah, <laughs> scalped him. That would have been awesome. That would have been awesome. There was so much that would have made this movie awesome. So much. And in so the end, much. they do defeat the evil Anthony Zerb. Okay, I can't even remember how they got him. Uh, he throws a knife into his throat. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because they're doing the classic, uh, the guy's got the girl, you know, in front of him with a knife to her throat. And like, you know, I'm going to kill her if you don't put your knives down. And uh, Patrick's way. So this works better if you have a gun. And it's like, man, this guy's got, you know, dead aim sights. And he can just kind of quick draw, blast the guy in the head. Here he throws a knife, which is, I think, a lot more dangerous even maybe (laughs) than shooting a guy with quick draw aim. He's a quick draw with the knife. Which would have been awesome if the wound had been, like, gushing blood, like, spurting right. blood. That would have been way cooler. Yeah. Several times I thought that. Well, especially with the Christopher Neem thing where he pulled the knife back out of his stomach. And so as he pulls yeah. the knife out, I'm like, we should have had the... Did you, guys, did you guys notice when he stabs him in the gut? Like, the moment he stabs him is very obviously, like, the yeah. sword under the arm bit. Yeah. 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 Did you notice that? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I did. It was very theatrical. Oh, no. <laughs> like now, now you die. <gasps> yeah. It fades it remind up. me of movies I would have made in like middle school. Yeah. Right. My friends. <laughs> now was this? Um, what's his name? Pool. Pool. Lance Hool. Is this his first movie? As a uh, no. Um, well, he did Missing uh, in Action before this. Missing Missing in Action 2 was before this. Yeah. Wow. Okay. So there's a reason why this guy uh, eventually moved to producing. Um, John is niche. <laughs> producing. And then at the end of the movie, um, yeah, Swayze decides to wander off into the sunset. The kid, of course, idolizes the uh, the man with no name, the mystery stranger. Uh, wants him to teach him to be a soldier. And what's the speech that we get there? Um, no, you need to be better than me. I'm no yeah. good. That sort of thing. Yeah. yeah. Did you... Not, I mean, I know it's written in the story, and we hear people say it, but like, I just don't... Like, it, I don't buy it. You know, it's like, you got a kid who's going like, wow, you did all this fucking awesome shit. You know, you're a badass. I want to be a badass. And the badass yeah. is sitting there going like, no, you don't want to be a badass. You don't want to. And I'm like, well, okay, yeah, why, because, though? Because, why? I don't get see, why. This, yeah, exactly. This is, again, why it's important for us to get more of that character backstory and really understand him. Because I think what they were thinking is he's done some sh- shit in his past that he's not proud of in his time as a soldier. But we don't know that. Mm-hmm. We don't know that he did these things. I think that's what they wanted us to think. But it doesn't come across at all. Yeah, I mean, the idea that, like, this life stains you and it ruins you and, like, it ruins all your, uh, you know, relationships, you know, I just, I don't feel that karma coming off of Patrick Swayze, (laughs) you know, which is why I'm saying I think he's just miscast in the part. Um, uh, That's one of the the first of the movie. You know, I'm saying he's a capable action performer and he's a capable emotional actor, but it's just like this is not, you know... His role. This is not a role that he can pull off. <laughs> yeah, he looks good with the beard, though. Yeah, he's got the he's got the Don Swayze beard. Yeah. Did he have a beard in any other movie? Uh, he had like a stubble in Point Break, but I think it was bleach yeah. blonde, and you know, so it didn't stand out. It wasn't mm-hmm. as dark. I think he has actually had a beard in uh, either Next of Kin or he's got a mustache. Uh, you know, or not the what am I Soul Patch or something? Like maybe I don't know. You gotta watch those movies. Yeah, I feel Swayze. like they were. I feel like they were really going for the Mad Max Two plot, where he's like trying to help the small community. But 
we understood Mad Max. <laughs> we we got what that character was about, so it made more sense to us. You know, we don't get that here. Well, Mad Max right. is a simple, you know, because like he really doesn't really care about anything other than himself. Uh, he'll help you if he can. You know, yeah. the opportunity presents itself. He's not like a co- a complete stone cold bastard, but he's like close. And I think that's what makes Mad Max more interesting. Like that's a dangerous motherfucker who will kill you. I never got that yeah. from Swayze. But that's the character we're told right. that he's but supposed that, to be. Right. And that's why it makes sense when Mad Max leaves when the job's done. Yeah. Whereas this, it's like, oh, it doesn't make sense. Yeah. Mad Max, there is no ho- hope for that guy. I mean, he's right. yeah, he's bent in his head, you know? Yeah, yeah <laughs> um, exactly. Oh, uh, and also the movie borrows the uh, guy who did the score for Mad Max and Mad Max. I was say, uh, we should talk about the one way these movies are actually linked, and that's <laughs> Mr. Brian May for composing music for this movie, Mad Max, and Mad Max Two. Yep. Yeah. So there you go. Boom. Well, that kind of brings us to the end of Steel Dawn. Uh, we're going to tell you uh, if we think you should watch it. We're going to go around the room and actually give it a review. Uh, so we hope you'll stick with us. But first of all, we're going to have to summon our mailman, and his name is Igor. Bring us the mail. Masters, masters, the mail. I've got the mail. So many letters. Our followers are rising, rising. Why, thank you, Igor. He's got that crazy, crazy wig on. And he even, like... <laughs> Walk wearing that? It's like bigger than him. Well, we can't tell if that's his rat, <laughs> his real rat tail, or the rat tail from the wig. Ow. It's actually it's an actual rat tail that he sewed on to the wig. Maybe that's what it was. Maybe it was like the guy had like a big like a I don't know. I was gonna say like a boar or some kind of big giant rat thing, fuzzy rat oh, no. on his head. I don't know. A it rodent like of he, unusual size. <laughs> yeah, he hollowed it out and just stuck it on his head. I mean, it is something to behold. Let me tell you. Um, you can join the fun, get a hold of us, and write to us so we can read your comments on our show. You can uh, follow along on Facebook. Facebook.com slash Starnate Freak Show. You can follow along on Twitter. At Set Freak Show. You can email us. Saturday Night Freak Show at Yahoo.com. And we're also on Instagram at Saturday Night Freak Show about Steel Dawn. Michael Whitaker writes in and says, I'll say this. There was a lot of dan- a lot more dancing than I was expecting in a bizarre abortion subplot. Oh, never mind. I put in the wrong DVD. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Uh, so Simon Carter says, the last time I saw this was when I rented the VHS. Yep, I'm old. And uh, those are the two reasons I don't remember squat about this movie. There you I go. Mean, I'm just surprised someone's seen it. Yeah. Well, I mean, it was, uh, I remember seeing the box, you know, on the video store shelves, like a lot everywhere I went. So it was like, if you were looking for a sci-fi movie, but even then I sat there going like, it looks like a cheap sci-fi movie, you know, just based right. on the, you know, uh, Travis Legler says, uh, I think I saw it once back in the day when on a day, my dad was home sick from work and he fell asleep during it. I know he and others said it kind of felt like a ripoff of the 1953 Western Shane. Well, there you go. <laughs> surprise, surprise. Um, yeah. There was actually a New York Times article by a guy, a guy named Walter Goodman, who was the first one that was like, hey, this is Shane, just so you all know. <laughs> yeah. Well, if you've, seen, if you've seen Shane and you watch it, you know, I mean, it's like, wow. I mean, that's the thing. It's, it's amazing to me that you can follow the plot of a movie that closely and not have to say like inspired by the novel but Shane by Jack Schaefer or whatever, you know, right. just, yeah. Can you just, at least steal? Logan had the balls to show the movie in the movie and be right. like, Hey yeah. guys, yeah. they like practically <laughs> looked at the camera and we're like, Hey, this is what we're doing. Yeah. Like we know. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not, I mean, mirroring the fucking plot. You know I mean? Mirroring the plot. Right. Um, oh God. Logan is so good. I know. Um, I just watched it last week and man, I shouldn't. I actually probably shouldn't have because I like. I was like, this movie is just so sad. Yeah, it is. Part of a movie. <laughs> okay. Well, Stephen Lepetak. I hope you're, I'm saying your name right. Says uh, I watched this a few times as a kid. It's an oddity. Um, Reader seventeen seventeen says, "What a crazy movie! I love Patrick Swayze so." It was a bit of required viewing. And uh, <laughs> I, I get that. Yeah, for sure. 
Novato Judoka is like, finally, an excuse to watch this. That's right. I think we thank you for following along. <laughs> <laughs> and also apologies. I yeah, guess. yeah, yeah, right. It's our fault. That- <laughs> I apologize for nothing. <laughs> for getting maloned again. <laughs> I don't uh, care. I stand by it. No, it's not your fault. You were misled <laughs> by a trailer. I was. <laughs> we should post the trailer just so everybody gets to see what Yes. We- Everyone um, should know. I'm not crazy. <laughs> I remember Colin showing us, and I remember thinking it looked awesome. Yeah. Yeah. But so did Metal Storm. Am I right? Metal that's Storm. very true. Another yeah, that's movie true. that this shares a lot very of. Very yeah. But you know, I think we, I think we go into these movies hoping that we're going to get another Yor. You know. Yeah, 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 yeah. There's only one Yor apparently. <laughs> <laughs> um, two weeks ago, we watched a movie called City of the Living Dead. Mark Harrison writes in and says, this film has a lot of good ideas. They just weren't well executed. Heresy, the hell you say, man? The hell you say? I mean, I guess I would need more specifics on that. Yeah. Yeah, I was like, I thought some of the ideas were really awesomely executed. That's why I liked it. Mm-hmm. Well, Sean but- Roger wrote that, because uh, oh, we posted a picture of the scene where Christopher George bashes open a coffin where uh, the lady's inside it alive with a pickaxe. Near, right. And he says, that dude really opens up that coffin with a complete disregard for her safety. Yeah. Yes. That, that scene pretty, was uncomfortable. <laughs> it was really uncomfortable. I was really scared for her. Uh, B-Movie Poster Vault writes in and says, a couple times a year, the cinema crew get together and play Choose Your Own Adventure, where everyone brings a flick and the order is determined randomly. The luck of the draw a few years back meant my son's opening movie pick of Despicable Me 2 was immediately followed up by City of the Living Dead. (laughs) Quite the jarring jump between tones. I mean, those minions are kind of horrifying, too. That is the most random double feature I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> oh, you want to you want a double feature with the minions. You got to watch a movie called Blood Sucking Freaks because there's a little <laughs> guy in that uh movie that looks like he's dressed exactly like the minions. Like did the oh, did wow. the creator of Despicable Me base it on the guy from Blood Sucking Freaks? You're going to I mean, to watch yes. them. That movie's got a lot of adult humor, so it probably yeah. <laughs> I mean, they're Practically fucking butt plugs with glasses and overalls, right? Like, yeah, the yellow and the overalls. This guy is dressed yeah. just like that. Yeah, you got to see it. Check it out. Blood sucking freaks. Um, so we're gonna go around the room, tell you what we thought of tonight's movie, Steel Dawn. Starting with Colin. Oh wow. What did you think of Steel Dawn? Um, unfortunately, listeners, it was a snoozer. Uh, yeah, like Holly, I was like, well, you know, I mean, but I guess the thing, you know, you figure at this point in your life, if Steel Dawn was a thing, you know, if it was a cult classic or it was so bad it's good, you would have heard more people talking about it. It's like the Patrick Swayze movie that none of his fans seem to remember. Um, you know, like kind of like uh, Raw Deal. Anybody? Sylvester or uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger? Raw no. Deal? Yeah, I. More familiar with that than I oh, am okay. with this. I was going to say that's the Arnold Schwarzenegger movie. That kind of, one of them that kind of gets. Oh yeah, that's right. I think that was the same year. That might have been, and it had like a similar poster, maybe black and white photo <laughs> of uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger. Um, yeah, unfortunately, it's. Um, well, I don't know. I, I feel like I've been kind of reviewing the movie my the whole way through it, so I really don't have much else to say. It kind of fails at uh, every uh, level of it. Uh, there's really nothing to recommend it. You know, not performance wise, not, uh, you know, uh, stunt work wise or choreography wise or um, there's no big set pieces. There's nothing that there's no moment in the movie that you're like, that was a cool stuff. Well, except for the first like five minutes. Yeah, there you go. Mm-hmm. That's the redeeming quality of this movie. It's got that first five minutes, uh, you know, whatever the attack by the walrus men who come out of the ground. And uh, that's the most creative and promising thing. Uh, that you're going to see in the the whole movie. And the rest of it is Shane. And you're probably better off watching Shane or one of the umpteen other clones of Shane (laughs) have been done (laughs) over the years. All of them, maybe even Malone. I can't remember. Like actually Malone just kind of went right out of my head too. After I saw it kind of like this one will. So let's go with pale rider. There you go. That's a good Shane. clone. (laughs) Check out pale rider. Don't watch steel Dawn. Whose title is still, a mystery eludes me. Yeah. That's right. So, Michaela, what do you think? 
Uh, yeah, I agree with a lot of what you said, Callan. Like I said, I'm disappointed because I thought for sure the sword was going to be named Steel Dawn and there'd be some mythology behind it. And like, it would be some like promised sword, like, like in Game of Thrones or something, you know? No, I, I, my hopes were far too high for this movie, apparently. Um, yeah, go, go. I mean, I feel like we've been pretty honest about our feelings throughout this whole episode, just because there isn't really much else to talk about with it. It's, I mean, even if you love Swayze, like, he's not really doing anything in this movie, so, you know. And, like, is it cool to see him act with his wife? I mean, not really, like. <laughs> Plus, they did, like, eight movies together, so. Yeah, it's, like, it's not even, like, ooh, their chemistry is just, like, jumping off the screen. They, it's, it's clear they're both very hot and covered in sand and, like, just not a great work environment. Like, and, it, yeah, go watch Logan, go watch, you know, Shane, fuck, go watch episode one, The Phantom Menace, you know, for all that it, it it's worth, you know, you get the same story there, too. It, it just really doesn't have any redeeming qualities. It's a shame that we were the victim again of a cool trailer. <laughs> so, yeah, it is, it's just boring and it feels so much longer than it is because it's so slow and has no momentum. So definitely a pass on Steel Dawn. Holly? Um, yeah, so I regret nothing. I, I stand by this choice. <laughs> I'm glad I got to see it. I don't think it's your I, fault. I don't think no. it's your fault, though. It's not. I just, I love bringing movies that I've never seen. I really love bringing movies that none of us have seen. I love doing that. Um, so that was, and then obviously, like we talked about the trailer. Once you watch that trailer, of course, you're going to want to check this movie out. Um, unfortunately, during my research, I got the general idea of what we were getting into, and I was like, oh, fuck. <laughs> 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 yeah, I, I was like, after the first five minutes, we're going to be greatly disappointed. <laughs> no. I knew, I knew, and I was like, shit. But, you know, if it, I mean, yeah, if we're going <sighs> to... I tend to be a glass half full kind of person, so if I'm looking for the positives, it's a cool sword. Uh, there's some cool choreography in this. The fight choreography is 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 pretty good. You know, Patrick Swayze does his spin kicks, and but there's not much of it. That's the thing. Like, there's not very many fight scenes, so you don't get very much of it. You get maybe like a total of what four minutes of fight scene. Like, it's not much. Um, you know, like I said before, I think one of the reasons people like post-apocalyptic movies is because they like seeing that creativity. They like seeing the set pieces. They like seeing like the costumes, the vehicles, like stuff that that people come up with um it's really appealing to see what's created unfortunately in this movie it's nothing that's very impressive it's all very cheap looking and it's it's nothing it, it's nothing saving for this movie and you know we talked about this was clearly written by someone that is not a writer and it shows he doesn't understand character development he doesn't understand character arc which are typically important things in writing a script um and there's nothing else that saves the lack of that. There's no great special effects. There's there's not a lot of blood. You know, there's not there's really nothing that saves this movie. It is a boring movie. Um, you know, and I would say, I, you know, Colin, you were saying go watch Shane, go watch. If you're going into this movie, I'm guessing you aren't going into it for a western. So I would say just watch Mad Max. Any of them, really, especially Fury Road. That's my favorite. Um, I would highly recommend you just revisit Fury Road. It's a great movie. Um, yeah, I can't, I can't recommend this movie as much as I was hoping it would be another Yor or something like that. It's just not. It's we're always chasing the next Yor, aren't we? We are. We are. He's the he's the unicorn. Um, but yeah, this was this was a letdown. I, I can't. I love Swayze, and I was happy to bring him. Happy to put him on the wall, and I have no regrets. But I will not recommend this movie <laughs> there you go it's uh, three hard passes All right hard pass is that a hard yeah, pass hard pass. Yes. Yeah. hard pass hard pass you're right hard fury pass. road was another in fury road there uh water is the the resource uh, yeah. yeah there was a lot of similarities i'm like eh. but you know yeah, way better movies so i don't care water. if they got inspired it's just way better yeah right well all right uh next week we're gonna watch a movie that's chosen by Ayla. What are we watching in your summer series? All right, so we're coming to the final stop of the blockbuster failure adventure. So <laughs> it's almost over. And we are I saved the best for last. I truly believe that. We're going to watch Dread from 2012. 
All right. Good choice. Oh, <laughs> see, Sean I... has not seen this. Holly has not seen this, correct? Correct. I have not seen this. So Colin and I, we've both seen it. Yeah, I got a copy of it. I got the 3D version. You remember that was Dread 3D when it came out. Yeah, so I'll be watching it down do. here. And... But I actually think it's some of the best use of 3D ever. I'm going to be watching it in 3D. I'm going to be watching it in 3D. <laughs> I'm happy to not watch it in 3D. <laughs> she just said it was some of the best ever. Okay. Well, it's I don't uh, 3D. <laughs> next week on the Saturday Night Freak Show. We hope you'll join us for Dread. And until then, ladies and germs, the basement is going dark. <laughs>